Nambach the Unveracious by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nambach the Unveracious by Jack London. Read by Don W. Jenkins. A bedarka, is it not so? Look, a bedarka, and one man who drives clumsily with a paddle. Old Basquawan rose to her knees, trembling with weakness and eagerness, and gazed out over the sea. Nambok was ever clumsy at the paddle, she maundered reminiscently, shading the sun from her eyes and staring across the silver-spilled water. Nambok was ever clumsy. I remember but the women and children laughed loudly, and there was a gentle mockery in their laughter, and her voice dwindled till her lips moved without sound. Kuga lifted his grizzled head from his bone-carving and followed the path of her eyes. Except when wide yawns took it off its course, a bedarka was headed in for the beach. Its occupant was paddling with more strength than dexterity and made his approach along the zigzag line of most resistance. Kuga's head dropped to his work again, and on the ivory tusk between his knees he scratched the dorsal fin of a fish the like of which never swam in the sea. "'It is doubtless the man from the next village,' he said finally, "'coming to consult with me about the marking of things on bone, and the man is a clumsy man. He will never know how.' "'It is Nambok,' old Basquawan repeated. "'Should I not know my son?' she demanded shrilly. I say, and I say again, it is Nambok. So thou hast said these many summers, one of the women chided softly. Ever when the ice passed out of the sea, hast thou sat and watched through the long day, saying at each chance canoe, This is Nambok. Nambok is dead. O Basquawan, and the dead do not come back. It cannot be that the dead come back. Nambok, the old woman cried so loud and clear that the whole village was startled and looked at her. She struggled to her feet and tottered down the sand. She stumbled over a baby lying in the sun, and the mother hushed its crying and hurled harsh words after the old woman, who took no notice. The children ran down the beach in advance of her, and as the man in the bedarka drew closer, nearly capsizing with one of his ill-directed strokes, the women followed. Kuga dropped his walrus tusk and went also, leaning heavily upon his staff, and after him loitered the men in twos and threes. The bedarka turned broadside, and the ripple of surf threatened to swamp it. Only a naked boy ran into the water and pulled the bow high up on the sand. The man stood up and sent a questing glance along the line of villagers. A rainbow sweater, dirty and the worse for wear, clung loosely to his broad shoulders, and a red cotton handkerchief was knotted in sailor fashion about his throat. A fisherman's tam o' shanter on his close-clipped head, and dungaree trousers and heavy brogans completed his outfit. But he was none the less a striking personage to these simple fisherfolk of the great Yukon Delta, who all their lives had stared out on Bering Sea and in that time seen but two white men, the census enumerator and a lost Jesuit priest. They were a poor people, with neither gold in the ground nor valuable furs in hand, so the whites had passed them afar. Also the Yukon, through the thousands of years, had shoaled that portion of the sea with the detritus of Alaska till vessels grounded out of sight of land. So the sodden coast, with its long inside reaches and huge mudland archipelagos, was avoided by the ships of men, and the fisherfolk knew not that such things were. Kuga, the bone-scratcher, retreated backward in sudden haste, tripping over his staff and falling to the ground. Nambok, he cried, as he scrambled wildly for footing. Nambok, who was blown off to sea, come back. The men and women shrank away, and the children scuttled off between their legs. Only Opiquan was brave, as befitted the head man of the village. He strode forward and gazed long and earnestly at the newcomer. It is Nambok, he said at last and at the conviction in his voice the women wailed apprehensively and drew farther away. The lips of the stranger moved indecisively, and his brown throat writhed and wrestled with unspoken words. La, la, it is Nambok, Basquawan croaked, peering up into his face. Ever did I say Nambok would come back. 
Ah, it is Nam Bok come back. This time it was Nam Bok himself who spoke, putting a leg over the side of the bedarka and standing with one foot afloat and one ashore. Again his throat writhed and wrestled as he grappled after forgotten words. And when the words came forth they were strange of sound, and a spluttering of the lips accompanied the gutturals. Greetings, O brothers, he said. Brothers of old time before I went away with the offshore wind. He stepped out with both feet on the sand, and Opequan waved him back. Thou art dead, Nambok, he said. Nambok laughed. I am fat. Dead men are not fat, Opequan confessed. Thou hast fared well, but it is strange. No man may mate with the offshore wind and come back on the heels of the years. I have come back, Nambok answered simply. Mayhap thou art a shadow, then, a passing shadow of the Nambok that was. Shadows come back. I am hungry. Shadows do not eat. But Opiquan doubted and brushed his hand across his brow in sore puzzlement. Nambok was likewise puzzled, and as he looked up and down the line found no welcome in the eyes of the fisher folk. The men and women whispered together. The children stole timidly back among their elders, and bristling dogs fawned up to him and sniffed suspiciously. I bore thee, Nambok, and I gave thee suck when thou wast little, Basquawan whimpered, drawing closer, and shadow though thou be, or no shadow, I will give thee to eat now. Nambok made to come to her, but a growl of fear and menace warned him back. He said something angrily in a strange tongue, and added, No shadow am I but a man. Who may know concerning the things of mystery? Opiquan demanded, half of himself and half of his tribe's people. We are, and in a breath we are not. If the man may become shadow, may not the shadow become man? Nambok was, but is not. This we know, but we do not know if this be Nambok or the shadow of Nambok. Nambok cleared his throat and made answer. In the old time long ago thy father's father, Opiquan, went away and came back on the heels of the years. Nor was a place by the fire denied him. It is said... He paused significantly, and they hung on his utterance. It is said, he repeated, driving his point home with deliberation, that Sip-Sip, his klooch, bore him two sons after he came back. But he had no doings with the offshore wind, Opiquan retorted. He went away into the heart of the land, and it is in the nature of things that a man may go on and on into the land. And likewise the sea, but that is neither here nor there. It is said that thy father's father told strange tales of the things he saw. Aye, strange tales he told. I too have strange tales to tell, Nambok stated insidiously, and as they wavered, and presents likewise. He pulled from the bedark a shawl, marvelous of texture and color, and flung it about his mother's shoulders. The women voiced a collective sigh of admiration, an old Basquawan ruffled the gay material and patted it and crooned in childish joy. He has tales to tell, Kuga muttered, and presents, a woman seconded. And Opiquan knew that his people were eager, and further, he was aware himself of an itching curiosity concerning those untold tales. The fishing has been good, he said judiciously, and we have oil in plenty, so come, Nambok, let us feast. Two of the men hoisted the bedarka on their shoulders and carried it up to the fire. Nambok walked by the side of Opiquan, and the villagers followed after, save those of the women who lingered in a moment to lay caressing fingers on the shawl. There was little talk while the feast went on, though many and curious were the glances stolen at the son of Basquawan. This embarrassed him, not because he was modest of spirit, however, but for the fact that the stench of the seal oil had robbed him of his appetite, and that he keenly desired to conceal his feelings on the subject. Eat, thou art hungry, Opiquan commanded, and Nambok shut both his eyes and shoved his fist into the big pot of putrid fish. La, la, be not ashamed. The seal were many this year, and strong men are ever hungry. And Basquawan sopped a particularly offensive chunk of salmon into the oil and passed it fondly and dripping to her son. In despair, premonitory symptoms warmed him that his stomach was not so strong as of old. He filled his pipe and struck up a smoke. The people fed on noisily and watched. 
Few of them could boast of intimate acquaintance with the precious weed, though now and again small quantities and abominable qualities were obtained in trade from the Eskimos to the northward. Kuga, sitting next to him, indicated that he was not averse to taking a draw, and between two mouthfuls, with the oil thick on his lips, sucked away at the amber stem. And thereupon Nambok held his stomach with a shaky hand and declined the proffered return. Kuga could keep the pipe, he said, for he had intended so to honor him from the first, and the people licked their fingers and approved of his liberality. Opiquan rose to his feet. And now, O Nambok, the feast is ended, and we would listen concerning the strange things you have seen. The fisher folk applauded with their hands, and gathering about them their work, prepared to listen. The men were busy fashioning spears and carving on ivory, while the women scraped the fat from the hides of the hair seal, and made them pliable or sewed mukluks with threads of sinew. Nambok's eyes roved over the scene, but there was not the charm about it that his recollection warranted him to expect. During the years of his wandering he had looked forward to just this scene, and now that it had come he was disappointed. It was a bare and meager life, he deemed, and not to be compared with the one to which he had become used. Still, he would open their eyes a bit, and his own eyes sparkled at the thought. Brothers, he began with the snug complacency of a man about to relate the big things he has done. It was late summer of many summers back, with much such weather as this promises to be when I went away. You all remember the day when the gulls flew low and the wind blew strong from the land and I could not hold my bedarka against it. I tied the covering of the bedarka about me so that no water could get in, and all of the night I fought with the storm. And in the morning there was no land, only the sea, and the offshore wind held me close in its arms and bore me along. Three such nights whitened into dawn and showed me no land, and the offshore wind would not let me go. And when the fourth day came, I was as a madman. I could not dip my paddle for want of food, and my head went round and round. What of the thirst that was upon me? But the sea was no longer angry and the soft south wind was blowing, and as I looked about me I saw a sight that made me think I was indeed mad. Nambok paused to pick away a sliver of salmon lodged between his teeth, and the men and women with idle hands and heads craned forward waited. It was a canoe, a big canoe. If all the canoes I have ever seen were made into one canoe, it would not be so large. There were exclamations of doubt, and Kuga, whose years were many, shook his head. If each bedarka were as a grain of sand, Nambok defiantly continued, and if there were as many bedarkas as there be grains of sand in this beach, still would they not make so big a canoe as this I saw on the morning of the fourth day. It was a very big canoe, and it was called a schooner. I saw this thing of wonder, this great schooner coming after me, and on it I saw men. Hold, O Nambok, Opiquan broke in. What manner of men were they? Big men? Nay, mere men like you and me. Did the big canoe come fast? Aye. The sides were tall, the men short, Opiquan stated the premises with conviction. And did these men dip with long paddles? Nambok grinned. There were no paddles, he said. Mouths remained open, and a long silence dropped down. Opiquan borrowed Kuga's pipe for a couple of contemplative sucks. One of the younger women giggled nervously and drew upon herself angry eyes. There were no paddles, Opiquan asked softly, returning the pipe. The south wind was behind, Nambok explained. But the wind drift is slow. The schooner had wings, thus. He sketched a diagram of masts and sails in the sand, and the men crowded around and studied it. The wind was blowing briskly, and for more graphic elucidation, he seized the corners of his mother's shawl and spread them out until it bellied like a sail. Basquawan scolded and struggled, but it was blown down the beach for a score of feet, and left breathless and stranded in a heap of driftwood. The men uttered sage grunts of comprehension, but Kuga suddenly tossed back his hoary head. Ho, ho! he laughed. A foolish thing, this big canoe. A most foolish thing plaything of the wind. Wheresoever the wind goes, it goes too. No man who journeys therein may name the landing beach, for always he goes with the wind, and the wind goes everywhere, but no man knows where. It is so, Opiquan supplemented gravely. 
With the wind the going is easy, but against the wind a man striveth hard, and for that they had no paddles. These men on the big canoe did not strive at all. Small need to strive, Nambok cried angrily. The schooner went likewise against the wind. And what said you made the sk sk schooner go? Kuga asked, tripping craftily over the strange word. The wind, was the impatient response. Then the wind made the sk sk schooner go against the wind. Old Kuga dropped an open leer to Opiquan, and the laughter growing around him continued. The wind blows from the south and blows the schooner south. The wind blows against the wind. The wind blows one way and the other at the same time. It is very simple. We understand, Nambok. We clearly understand. Thou art a fool. Truth falls from thy lips, Kuga answered meekly. I was over long in understanding, and the thing was simple. But Nambok's face was dark, and he said rapid words which they had never heard before. Bone scratching and skin scraping were resumed, but he shut his lips tightly on the tongue that could not be believed. The sk sk schooner, Kuga imperturbably asked, it was made of a big tree? It was made of many trees, Nambok snapped shortly. It was very big. He lapsed into sullen silence again, and Opiquan nudged Kuga, who shook his head with slow amazement and murmured, It is very strange. Nambok took the bait. That is nothing, he said airily. You should see the steamer. As the grain of sand is to Badarka, as the Badarka is to the schooner, so the schooner is to the steamer. Further, the steamer is made of iron. It is all iron. Nay, nay, Nambok, cried the headman. How can that be? Always iron goes to the bottom. For behold, I received an iron knife in trade from the headman of the next village, and yesterday the iron knife slipped from my fingers and went down, down into the sea. To all things there be law. Never was there one thing outside the law. This we know. And moreover, we know that things of a kind have the one law, and that all iron has the one law. So unsay thy words, Nambok, that we may yet honor thee. It is so, Nambok persisted. The steamer is all iron and does not sink. Nay, nay, this cannot be. With my own eyes I saw it. It is not in the nature of things. But tell me, Nambok, Kuga interrupted, for fear the tale would go no farther. Tell me the manner of these men in finding their way across the sea when there was no land by which to steer. The sun points out the path. But how? At midday the head man of the schooner takes a thing through which his eye looks at the sun, and then he makes the sun climb down out of the sky to the edge of the earth. Now this be evil medicine, cried Opi Kwan, aghast at the sacrilege. The men held up their hands in horror, and the women moaned. This be evil medicine. It is not good to misdirect the great sun which drives away the night and gives us the seal, the salmon, and warm weather. What if it be evil medicine? Nambok demanded truculently. I too have looked through the thing at the sun and made the sun climb down out of the sky. Those who were nearest drew away from him hurriedly, and a woman covered the face of a child at her breast so that his eye might not fall upon it. But on the morning of the fourth day, O oh Nambok, Kuga suggested, on the morning of the fourth day when the sk sk schooner came after thee, I had little strength left in me and could not run away. So I was taken on board and water was poured down my throat and good food given me. Twice, my brothers, you have seen a white man. These men were all white and as many as I have fingers and toes. And when I saw they were full of kindness, I took heart and I resolved to bring away with me report of all that I saw. And they taught me the work they did, and gave me good food and a place to sleep. And day after day we went over the sea, and each day the head man drew the sun down out of the sky and made it tell where we were. And when the waves were kind, we hunted the fur seal, and I marveled much, for always did they fling the meat and the fat away and save only the skin. Opiquan's mouth was twitching violently, and he was about to make denunciation of such waste when Kuga kicked him to be still. After a weary time, when the sun was gone and the bite of the frost came into the air, the headman pointed the nose of the schooner south. South and east we traveled for days upon days, and never the land in sight, and we were near to the village from which hailed the men. How did they know they were near? O Opiquan, unable to contain himself longer, demanded. There was no land to see. Nambok glowered at him wrathfully. 
Did I not say the headman brought the sun down out of the sky? Kuga interposed, and Nambok went on. As I say, when we were near to that village, a great storm blew up, and in the night we were helpless and knew not where we were. Thou hast just said the headman knew. O oh, peace, Opiquan, thou art a fool and cannot understand. As I say, we were helpless in the night, when I heard above the roar of the storm the sound of the sea on the beach, and next we struck with a mighty crash, and I was in the water swimming. It was a rock-bound coast, with one patch of beach in many miles, and the law was that I should dig my hands into the sand and draw myself clear of the surf. The other man must have pounded against the rocks, for none of them came ashore but the head man, and him I knew only by the ring on his finger. When day came, there being nothing of the schooner, I turned my face to the land and journeyed into it that I might get food and look upon the faces of the people. And when I came to a house, I was taken in and given to eat, for I had learned their speech, and the white men are ever kindly. And it was a house bigger than all the houses built by us and our fathers before us. It was a mighty house, Kuga said, masking his unbelief with wonder. And many trees went into the making of such a house, Opiquan added, taking the cue. That is nothing, Nambok shrugged his shoulders in belittling fashion. As our houses are to that house, so that house was to the houses I was yet to see. And they are not big men? Nay, mere men like you and me, Nambok answered. I had cut a stick that I might walk in comfort, and remembering that I was to bring report to you, my brothers, I cut a notch in the stick for each person who lived in that house. And I stayed there many days and worked, for which they gave me money, a thing of which you know nothing, but which is very good. And one day I departed from that place to go farther into the land, and as I walked I met many people, and I cut smaller notches in the stick that there might be room for all. Then I came upon a strange thing. On the ground before me was a bar of iron, as big in thickness as my arm, and a long step away was another bar of iron. Then wert thou a rich man, Opiquan asserted, for iron be worth more than anything else in the world. It would have made many knives. Nay, it was not mine. It was a find, and a find be lawful. Not so, the white man had placed it there. And further, these bars were so long that no man could carry them away, so long that as far as I could see there was no end to them. Nambok, that is very much iron, Opiquan cautioned. I... It was hard to believe with my own eyes upon it, but I could not gainsay my eyes, and as I looked I heard. He turned abruptly on the headman. Opiquan, thou hast heard the sea lion bellow in his anger. Make it plain in thy mind as many sea lions as there be waves in the sea, and make it plain that all these sea lions be made into one sea lion, and as that one sea lion would bellow, so bellowed the thing I heard. The fisherfolk cried aloud in astonishment, and Opiquan's jaw lowered and remained lowered. And in the distance I saw a monster like unto a thousand whales. It was one-eyed, and vomited smoke, and it snorted with exceeding loudness. I was afraid, and ran with shaking legs along the path between the bars. But it came with speed of the wind, this monster, and I leaped the iron bars with its breath hot on my face. Opiquan gained control of his jaw again. And, and then, O oh Nambok, it came by on the bars, and harmed me not, and when my legs could hold me up again, it was gone from sight, and it is a very common thing in that country. Even the women and children are not afraid. Men make them to do work, these monsters. As we make our dogs do work, Kuga asked, with skeptic twinkle in his eye. Aye, as we make our dogs do work. And how do they breed these, these things? Opiquan questioned. They breed not at all. Men fashion them cunningly of iron, and feed them with stone, and give them water to drink. The stone becomes fire, and the water becomes steam, and the steam of the water is the breath of their nostrils, and... There, there, O Nambuk, Opiquan interrupted. Tell us of other wonders. We grow tired of this, which we may not understand. You do not understand? Nambok asked despairingly. Nay, we do not understand, the men and women wailed back. We cannot understand. Nambok thought of a combined harvester, and of the machines wherein visions of living men were to be seen, and of the machines from which came the voices of men, and he knew his people could never understand. Dare I say I rode this iron monster through the land? he asked bitterly. Opiquan threw up his hands, palms outward, in open incredulity. 
Say on, say anything, we listen. Then did I ride the iron monster, for which I gave money. Thou saidst it was fed with stone. And likewise, thou fool, I said money was a thing of which you know nothing. As I say, I rode the monster through the land and through many villages until I came to a big village on a salt arm of the sea, and the houses shoved their roofs among the stars in the sky, and the clouds drifted by them, and everywhere was much smoke, and the roar of that village was like the roar of the sea in storm, and the people were so many that I flung away my stick and no longer remembered the notches upon it. Hadst thou made small notches, Kuga reproved, thou mightst have brought report. Nambok whirled upon him in anger. Had I made small notches, listen, Kuga, thou scratcher of bone, if I had made small notches, neither the stick nor twenty sticks could have borne them, nay, not all the driftwood of all the beaches between this village and the next. And if all of you, the women and children as well, were twenty times as many, and if you had twenty hands each, and in each hand a stick and a knife, still the notches could not be cut for the people I saw. So many were they, and so fast did they come and go. There cannot be so many in all the world, Opiquan objected, for he was stunned, and his mind could not grasp such magnitude of numbers. What dost thou know of all the world, and how large it is? Nambok demanded. But there cannot be so many people in one place. Who art thou to say what can be and what cannot be? It stands to reason that there cannot be so many people in one place. Their canoes would clutter the sea till there was no room, and they would empty the sea each day of its fish, and they would not all be fed. So it would seem, Nambok made final answer, yet it was so. With my own eyes I saw and flung my stick away. He yawned heavily and rose to his feet. I have paddled far. The day has been long and I am tired. Now I will sleep, and tomorrow we will have further talk upon the things I have seen. Basquawan, hobbling fearfully in advance, proud indeed, yet awed by her wonderful son, led him to her igloo, and stowed him away among the greasy, ill-smelling furs. But the men lingered by the fire, and a council was held wherein there was much whispering and low-voiced discussion. An hour passed, and a second, and Nambok slept, and the talk went on. The evening sun dipped toward the northwest, and at eleven at night was nearly due north. Then it was that the head man and the bone scratcher separated themselves from the council and aroused Nambok. He blinked up into their faces and turned on his side to sleep again. Opiquan gripped him by the arm and kindly but firmly shook his senses back into him. Come, Nambok, arise, he commanded. It be time. Another feast, Nambok cried. Nay, I am not hungry. Go on with the eating and let me sleep. Time to be gone, Kuga thundered. But Opiquan spoke more softly. Thou wast Bedarka mate with me when we were boys, he said. Together we first chased the seal and drew the salmon from the traps, and thou didst drag me back to life, Nambok, when the sea closed over me and I was sucked down to the black rocks. Together we hungered and bore the chill of the frost, and together we crawled beneath the one fur and lay close to each other. And because of these things and the kindness in which I stood to thee, it grieves me sore that thou shouldst return such a remarkable liar. We cannot understand, and our heads be dizzy with the things thou hast spoken. It is not good, and there has been much talk in the council. Wherefore we send thee away, that our heads may remain clear and strong, and be not troubled by the unaccountable things. These things thou speakest of be shadows, Kuga took up the strain. From the shadow world thou hast brought them, and to the shadow world thou must return them. Thy bedarka be ready, and the tribes people wait. They may not sleep until thou art gone. Nambok was perplexed, but hearkened to the voice of the headman. If thou art Nambok, Opiquan was saying, thou art a fearful and most wonderful liar. If thou art the shadow of Nambok, then thou speakest of shadows concerning which it is not good that living men have knowledge. This great village thou hast spoken of, we deem the village of the shadows. Therein flutter the souls of the dead, for the dead be many, and the living few. The dead do not come back. Never have the dead come back, save thou with thy wonder tales. It is not meet that the dead come back, and should we permit it, great trouble may be our portion. Nambok knew his people well, and was aware that the voice of the council was supreme, so he allowed himself to be led down to the water's edge, where he was put aboard his bedarka and a paddle thrust into his hand. A stray wild fowl honked somewhere to seaward, and the surf broke limply and hollowly on the sand. 
a dim twilight brooded over land and water, and in the north the sun smoldered, vague and troubled, and draped about with blood-red mists. The gulls were flying low, the offshore wind blew keen and chill, and the black-massed clouds behind it gave promise of bitter weather. Out of the sea thou earnest, Opiquan chanted oracularly, and back into the sea thou goest, this is the balance achieved, and all things brought to law. Basquawan limped to the froth mark and cried, I bless thee, Nambok, for that thou remembered me. But Kuga, shoving Nambok clear of the beach, tore the shawl from her shoulders and flung it into the bedarka. It is cold in the long night, she wailed, and the frost is prone to nip old bones. The thing is a shadow, the bone scratcher answered, and shadows cannot keep thee warm. Nambok stood up that his voice might carry. O oh, Basquawan, mother that bore me, he called, listen to the words of Nambok thy son. There be room in this Bedarka for two, and we, he would that thou earnest with him, for his journey is to where there are fish and oil in plenty. There the frost comes not, and life is easy, and the things of iron do the work of men. Wilt thou come, O oh, Basquawan? She debated a moment while the Bedarka drifted swiftly from her, then raised her voice to a quavering treble. I am old, Nambok, and soon I shall pass down among the shadows, but I have no wish to go before my time. I am old, Nambok, and I am afraid. A shaft of light shot across the dim-lit sea, and wrapped boat and man in a splendor of red and gold. Then a hush fell upon the fisher folk, and only was heard the moan of the offshore wind and the cries of the gulls flying low in the air. End of Nambok the Unveracious by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com.